Hey guys, welcome to Monday morning reading class. What we're going to start doing for reading is we're going to read our book, I Survived the American Revolution 1776 by Laura Tarshish. So you should have a copy of this book at home. I have it on my Kindle here so I can read it along with you. You also need your pre-reading questions, which I've attached to your email. They look like this. And for homework tonight, you need the attachment that I sent out that looks like this for your discussion questions for chapters one and two. It's one long document with all the chapters for this week on it, so you only have to answer chapters one and two for homework tonight. You can send the document back to me and I will count it for homework and everybody who sends it back gets five house points for their house. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the cover. So this is the front cover. I noticed the title. I noticed at the top it says it's a best-selling series. I notice the name of the author and I see that it's printed from Scholastic. I also want you to take a look at the back cover. Now, I don't have the back cover on the digital copy, but I do have a picture of it here from Amazon. So I want you to look and read the back jacket. It says British soldiers were everywhere. There was no escape. Nathaniel Fox never imagined he'd find himself in the middle of a blood-soaked battlefield fighting for his life. He was only 11 years old, so he's just a little older than you guys are. He would barely paid attention to the troubles between America and England. How could he, while being worked to the bone by his cruel uncle, Uriah Storch? But when his uncle's rage forces him to flee the only home he knows, Nate is suddenly propelled toward a thrilling and dangerous journey into the heart of the American, I'm sorry, the Revolutionary War. He finds himself in New York City on the brink of what will be the biggest battle yet. So there's a couple of words here in the jacket that I'm already a little confused about, so I want to look back. I can tell that Nathaniel Fox is our main character that he's going to be in some part of the American Revolution. He's 11 years old. What we know is that the battle was between America and England because remember, the colonists wanted to break free from the king. We meet a cruel uncle. I know cruel means mean, and his name is Uriah Storch. So Uriah's rage forces Nathaniel to flee the only home he knows. This word was one of our vocabulary words, and I remember that flee means to run away. So he's being propelled toward a thrilling and dangerous journey. I know a propeller is something on a boat or a plane that makes it go forward. So Nate is being pushed forward on a dangerous journey. This is all sounding very, very exciting to me. So what you're going to do is you're gonna open up your pre-reading questions. You're gonna work on these before we even open up the story. It asks you to look at the cover and the illustrations throughout the book. So you get to open the book and flip through some of the pages. Make a prediction. What you think this book is about what do you currently know about the American Revolution? So this question, this first question is a two-part answer. I'm asking you to make a prediction of what you think the book will be about, and I'm asking you to tell me what you know about the American Revolution. I know we haven't started the American Revolution yet. We're still in colonial America, but there might be some things that you do know about the American Revolution. When you're making your prediction, Please don't just write, I think the book is going to be exciting. I'm looking for a few sentences for you to really think, for you to really predict. What is this book going to be about? We know we have a character named Nate. We know we have a mean uncle. Make a prediction. 
Question two asks us, have you ever read any other stories from the I Survive series? I know a bunch of you have. Tell me about them. What do you remember from the stories? There's some really great books in this series, especially if you like American history. So pause the video, take a few minutes, give me some good answers, some real thinking on your pre-reading questions. Pause the video now and answer them. Okay, welcome back. So now we have our story here and we're getting ready to read. And while I will read out loud to you, I do expect you to follow along with me. So here we go. Here's our front cover and the inside of the jacket. I survived the American Revolution, 1776. So my book will look a little different than yours because like I said, mine is the digital copy, but your first two pages should look something like this. So as I look at this first page, I see that it says, to all brave, healthy, able-bodied and well-disposed young men in this neighborhood who have any inclination to join the troops now raising under General Washington, that's George Washington, for the defense of liberties and independence of the United States, take notice. So this looks like some sort of ad that they would have asked any brave, healthy, able-bodied, and well-disposed young men. Women were not able to fight in the war, but it looks like this was an ad asking you to fight for your liberty with General Washington. Chapter 1. August 29th, 1776 in Brooklyn, New York. And before I even start reading, I notice this gun here. This is a rifle that they would have carried. See them in the picture carrying the very similar rifle? And it has what's called a bayonet. Look very close at this gun. And do you see this silver sword looking thing sticking off the front? That was called a bayonet. And they would have that at the end of the gun for close combat. They would want to shoot you from far away, but if they were unlucky enough to get close to you, they would use that similar to a sword in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Here we go. Chapter 1. Nathaniel Fox was too young to be fighting in the Revolutionary War. He was only 11 years old. But here... He was on a blood-soaked battlefield in Brooklyn, New York. Thousands of British soldiers were on the attack, and Nate was sure that he was about to die. Why is he so sure he's about to die? Think about it for a minute. Gunfire crackled through the air. Crack! Cannon Blasts shook the ground. Kaboom! Already, one of Nate's friends was lying dead in the dirt, shot through the heart. And now, Nate was running for his life. Why is he running for his life? He tore through the thick forest, dodging trees and stumbling over rocks. His mind swirled with fear. Blood pounded in his ears. And then came an even more terrifying sound. Heavy footsteps right behind him. Nate whipped his head around in panic. Over his shoulder, he saw an enormous soldier chasing after him. The man's musket was aimed at Nate's back. Attached to the gun's tip was a killing sword, a bayonet, like the one I showed you in the picture. Nate ran faster, desperate to escape, but he could hear the man's pounding steps and his grunting breath. I'm not a soldier, Nate wanted to scream, but it was too late. The man was closing in, closer, closer, closer. Nate braced himself for the killing stab. He was sure this was the end. And then, 
came an ear-shattering blast. Boom! Nate saw flames, a blinding light, and then the world went black. Before you turn to chapter two, think about it. Draw a conclusion. What happened to Nate when everything went black? Pause the video if you have to. Come up with an answer in your brain and then go on to chapter two. Chapter two. Seven weeks earlier than the chapter we just read. So we're rewinding in time to July 11th, 1776. It's 12 o'clock noon, and our character, Nate, is in Norwalk, Connecticut, not Brooklyn like he was before. Nate crawled along his uncle's vegetable garden, tugging up weeds and flicking away fat green worms. The burning sun cooked his back. His muscles ached from hours of work. But even worse was the sound of his uncle's voice, barking through the open dining room window. His uncle was talking about the war with England. Now stop for a second and think about how the setting has changed. What was different from the setting in the first chapter to now the beginning of the second chapter? Stop the video if you have to. Think about your answer. Nate peeked through the window. His uncle, Uriah Storch, was sitting at the fine wooden table. He was eating his noon meal with his best friend, Mr. Marston. Nate breathed in the delicious food smells, but there was nothing delicious about watching Storch gobble the leg of a roasted goose. Storch pretended to be a gentleman, but Nate had seen hogs with better manners. George Washington should be hanged, Storch was saying, cracking the poor goose's bones with his large teeth. George Washington was the commander of the American army. Most people in Connecticut loved General Washington. They called themselves patriots, which means they were rooting for America to win the war. But Storch and his pal were on England's side. Storch hated George Washington more than he hated the fleas that crawled around his curled white wig. Cause remember, Men wore wigs back then. They were very fashionable. Storch turned toward the kitchen and bellowed, More meat! Seconds later, Eliza hurried in, carrying a silver platter piled high with fresh goose. Eliza stood patiently while the men heaped food on their plates. She'd been up since dawn cooking this meal, but neither of the men thanked her or even looked at her. Hmm, why are they not thanking her? Why are they not looking at her? Nate hated living here with Storch, but Eliza had it far worse. Nate was his nephew. Eliza was Storch's slave. Nate caught Eliza's eye through the window. He pushed together his lips and puffed out his cheeks his best Storch imitation. Eliza raised her eyebrow at Nate, a reminder that he'd better watch himself. Storch was always looking for an excuse to give Nate a whack with his walking stick. He would not be happy to see Nate's blue eyes peering through the window. Nate ducked away. He had hours of work left to do, but he needed a break from the heat. He went to a shady spot under the cherry tree and looked down at the Long Island Sound. He loved watching the ships sailing by. Nate closed his eyes and pretended he was on one of those ships, headed out to the open sea. His mind was filled with the sounds of flapping sails and squawking seagulls. He imagined a cool sea breeze ruffling his hair. 
he could practically feel his father's strong hand resting on his shoulder. Papa had been a ship's captain. After Nate's mama got sick and died, when Nate was just four, Papa started taking Nate along with him on his voyages. Nate grew up crisscrossing the ocean with Papa and his crews. What a happy life. Sure, not every kid would want to grow up on the sea. The creaking wooden sailing ships were crawling with rats. The stale, wormy biscuits could break your teeth. Nate's bed was a hammock hanging from the ceiling. But none of that mattered because Nate was with Papa. Nate pictured his father's green eyes flashing from under his old sailing cap, his black ponytail waving in the wind. He'd wrap his arms around Nate's shoulder as they stood on the deck, looking out at the endless ocean. You never know what's ahead, Papa would say, his eyes brimming with excitement. But now, a wave of sadness crashed over Nate. Papa died almost two years ago, while they were sailing home from a trip to the Caribbean islands. The voyage had been smooth, with steady winds, a glassy sea, and a crew of ten men. Nate's favorite crew member was Paul Dobbins, a joking 18-year-old with bright red hair and a gap-toothed grin. He'd sailed with Papa before and had always treated Nate like a favorite brother. They had been halfway through their three-week voyage home when they sailed into a path of a wicked storm. It came out of nowhere, a ferocious squall. A squall is a storm. A ferocious squall with swirling black clouds, pounding rain, and lightning that tore open the sky. The winds blew like dragon's breath. Waves crashed over the deck. Papa and the crew worked frantically, sliding across rain-soaked decks and pushing through the whipping winds. Giant, twisting waves spun the ship like a toy. The crew managed to take down the sails, but then a 20-foot wave grabbed hold of Papa and swept him off the deck. In a blink, he was swallowed up by the sea and gone forever. Suddenly, Nate was an orphan with just one living relative in the world. The uncle that Papa had always hated. Papa had stayed away from Storch, a man as mean as he was rich. Storch was the last person Papa would have wanted Nate to live with. But where else would Nate go? Paul had promised to stay in touch. He hugged Nate tight and sworn he'd always look after him. We're blood, you and me, he said. But that was just talk. Nate hadn't heard a peep from Paul in two years, and he had no idea why. Why do you think Paul hasn't reached out to Nate? Two years without him on the ship after his father died. And Nate still hasn't heard from Paul. What do you think? Nate knew he should be thankful that Storch gave him a home. Plenty of orphans ended up as beggars. At least Nate had a family to take him in. Except Storch had never treated Nate like family. A stray dog was more like it. It was Eliza who made sure Nate knew he wasn't alone in the world. During Nate's first months with Storch, he was tortured by nightmares. He'd wake up and find Eliza, sitting by his bed. She'd be gripping his hand tight, like she'd just pulled him out of the churning sea. She was Nate's family now. Nate stood there, under the cherry tree, his mind swirling with sad memories. He was so distracted, he didn't hear the footsteps creeping up behind him. Something poked his back. A voice growled. Back to work, or I'll chop you up. We're going to stop there for today.
What I would like you to do is open up the Word document that I attached this morning. Here you'll see your Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 questions. You can click right on the question itself, hit the Enter key, and you can begin writing your answer to the questions. I'd really like you to use detail. I'd like you to restate. I want you to practice all of the strategies we've been working on in school. After you've written your answers for the chapter, you can go up to the top of your screen You hit File, and you hit Save. Oop, the computer doesn't want to work. There you go. And you hit Save. When you save it, it will save your answers. And then you go into your email, and you attach this document and send it back to me. I'll get your question answers, and you will get credit for your homework, your classwork, and you will get house points. If you're not so sure how to attach the document, you could always take a picture and email me the picture as well. All right, guys, don't read too far ahead. I want to read together. Enjoy your chapter one and two. I will see you tonight at six o'clock. Bring your pre-reading questions and your comprehension chapter one and two. See you later.